course, the aging brain can still change. It's plastic. Exercise has been shown to change actual gray matter volume and white matter volume. So structural changes as well as functional changes. Human OS. Learn. Master. Achieve. Dr. Jonathan Burdett, welcome to Human OS Radio. My pleasure to be here. If you could give our listeners introduction to who you are, where you work, and the type of research you do. Okay, I am a neuroradiologist, so a brain imaging guy at Wake Forest School of Medicine in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. 50% of my life is clinical, so like all last weekend, <laughs> I was reading CT scans and MRI scans of people's brains and uh, spines. And 50% of my life as part of the Laboratory for Complex Brain Networks that I co-founded with Paul Arienti, and where we research the brain from an imaging standpoint using brain networks. But I would say over the last decade, has been a big shift from traditional fMRI to network science-based methods, but looking at the brain more as a collection of connected nodes and looking at relationships between areas of the brain rather than just this area of the brain does this or this area of the brain does that. Generally, aside from looking at network patterns, are there certain topics that you're interested in exploring? Yeah, our lab is pretty focused on healthy aging or the aging brain. Mm -hmm. And uh, we work closely with the undergraduate campus at Wake Forest University, the Translational Science Center there, whose mission is to come up with practical applications to translate sort of health research into practical things for older adults, basically to help to foster independence without taking medications and things like that. So we work closely with them. So this whole uh, healthy aging and they investigate exercise effects, food effects, and things like that. We've also worked in a big sort of project in migrant farmers and the effects of pesticides in the brain because mm. there's a large migrant farmer population here in North Carolina. We've also done things like the effects of music on the brain, which also affects old people, worked in caffeine, things like that. So mostly healthy aging now. That's a lot of what our lab does. Tell us about your most recent study looking at beetroot juice, of all things. Of all things. Of all things. So why beetroot juice and what were you specifically exploring we need our nitrogen species for optimal blood flow. Researchers know that nitric oxide dilates blood vessels, decreases blood pressure, increases blood flow, especially in hypoxic conditions. Well, vegetables, for example, like beets, are loaded with nitrate. And so if you eat your beets, you will get a boost in your nitrate, which will then be taken up by your salivary glands and converted to nitrite, which will then travel around looking for hypoxic areas and be converted to nitric oxide, and you'll increase your blood flow. That has been shown over and over again. If you're diabetic with poor circulation, you'll increase your circulation if you increase the amount of nitrate, in this case, nutritionally. It's been shown in sports and athletes. The London Olympics, the beetroot juice Olympics, people are taking beetroot juice shots all the time mm -hmm. to increase blood flow. Uh, my daughter uh, runs cross country. She takes a beetroot shot an hour before she races mm -hmm. and feels like it helps her. It may just be mental, who knows, but actually it probably does help her. So we knew that. And we had done a study just showing acutely that if you scan someone and get their blood flow of their brain, do a beetroot juice shot scan them again, you will have acute changes in blood flow to your brain. We show this in elderly people to the deep white matter in the frontal lobes. And so we had some preliminary data. Mm -hmm. Beetroot juice does what it's supposed to do. It increases blood flow, probably to the brain. We know as you age, your capacity of your blood vessels to your brain decreases and, it, and you get chronic ischemic changes and things like that. It's just mm -hmm. what you get. And so we knew that there's some acute changes. So this might be helpful. We also know that exercise can lead to neuroplasticity in the aging brain. And that's been shown in lots of studies. And we know that beetroot juice helps exercise. And so we thought, well, maybe if there's some synergistic effects between the beet juice and the exercise on the aging brain. So that's kind of what we did. We tested that and looked specifically at somatomotor regions, communities, based on other previous work from around here and found some interesting results. It did have synergistic effects on the brain communities. Mm. So that's kind of exciting. For those that are unfamiliar with the term neuroplasticity, give a primer on that. The brain changing structure function due to certain stimuli, certain activities is not 
a super deep thought, but it was thought that the aging brain really didn't change that much. It wasn't that dynamic. And of course, that's been blown out of the water that, of course, the aging brain can still change. It's plastic. Exercise has been shown to change actual gray matter volume and white matter volume. Mm -hmm. So structural changes as well as functional changes. So just basically changes in structure and function due to certain activities and or certain inputs. How unique are beets? How different are they than other vegetables in the amount of nitrates they contain? Is it a lot more or it just tends to be one of the higher sources that we have in nature? That's a great question. I'm not a nutrition expert. Actually, Gary Miller is the nutrition expert in this study. However, it is a very good question because if you go online, you will see that beets are not the highest mm. in nitrates. If you eat arugula greens, yep. it's actually even higher. So mm. beets are very high yeah. in nitrate. But they're all your green leafy vegetables are also very high. You've kale, mm-hmm. spinach, these, these sorts of things. I think it's easy to make beet juice yeah. rather than a kale juice or arugula juice. But all of those vegetables are loaded with nitrogen species as well as antioxidants and vitamins and magnesium and iron, also folates, B vitamins, all these kind of things. So again, eat your vegetables. But I don't actually have an answer to why mm. beetroot juice rather than other high nitrogen species, right. except that you can make it. Maybe it's just more palatable for people than arugula shot. By the way, I've tried beetroot shots before exercise and I've noticed it. And one of the more interesting things coming back to sleep that I've heard recently is that when we have less sleep than we need, so you miss a couple hours over the night, you have a decrease in a substance called BH4. Mm-hmm. So we don't need to really go into that, but the result of it is you have decreased nitric oxide and you then see an increased activity of these sleep promoting cells in the brain. And so what I've experimented with and what I've also read in researching for this podcast. I went online and I looked at the beet product used in your study. Yeah. And one of the first comments from somebody was talking about how they had improved alertness and they weren't expecting that. It probably is related to what your sleep work. Yeah. It really suggests that if you want to have good alertness and who doesn't, I mean, how many people drink caffeine in the world? And particularly if you missed out on your ideal night of sleep, having nitrate containing foods in the morning, either through the form of a juice or a salad, something like that can potentially go a long way in helping you feel a lot better during the day. So not only are you trying to necessarily amp up the alerting effects of blocking adenosine through caffeine, but you actually might be reducing the pressure for sleep by affecting the sleep promoting cells. Totally speculative, but there is an interesting mechanism and I've been playing with it a little bit and I feel like I do perform better when I have veggies in the morning, whether I got good sleep or didn't. Interesting. What was this intervention like? How many different groups did you have? What were you testing? Yeah, but that same company, by the way, that does the beat it shots yeah. has a placebo that looks just like the other one, but does not have the nitrogen in it. Mm. That's why they are a very convenient uh, group to use. So half the people of the 26 people, half would take a beetroot shot one hour before exercise. And this was an exercise, aerobic exercise intervention on a treadmill. It was a six-week intervention. They would come in three times a week, so six times three, 18 treadmill interventions, if you will. And they would take their beetroot shot one hour before the exercise. On the other days, they actually drank beetroot shot at about the same time every single day. Seven days a week, they did a beetroot shot. But three of those days, they actually had an exercise intervention. And this was performed on elderly people, though I'm getting very close to their age, uh, greater than or equal to 55 years old, okay. sedentary people, which can be defined, I think it's less than 60 minutes of moderate exercise in a week. Mm-hmm. And we actually chose people with some mild hypertension, a blood pressure of 130 to 160, because we thought the beetroot juice might have a bigger effect in these people, quite frankly. And this is sort of preliminary work. And uh, yeah, that's the group. And half of them took beat it. And half of them took a placebo. The actually the beat it shot itself has about 560 milligrams, I think, of nitrate, which is a handful of beets, basically. Might be like three beets. And so three sessions a week. And they would come in and be monitored. And experts on the physiology of such things were monitoring for met capacities. Because that was another question. Uh, did they actually improve more? Right. If, if you took the beat shot, they almost did, statistically. It was close. Definitely had a trend toward uh, perf- better exercise performance, which has been shown already in athletes. So that's the study. And I, being an imager, was very interested in what their brains looked like. So all these people were scanned before the study started within a couple of days. And then after the study was over, not on an exercise day, within a couple of days after the study was over. Okay. And so we just did comparing pre and post. And that's where we found our findings. Five days a week, or was it seven days a week, they were taking the beetroot shot? 
Every day they took a beach shot. Okay. Three days a week they exercised. Correct. They did 50 minutes of walking essentially in this sedentary population that it was mildly hypertensive. And although there was a trend towards improvements in exercise performance, yeah. perhaps you would have seen them if the study went longer or... More people. Yeah, more people. Exactly. Okay. Tell us a little bit more about the connectivity. What was found there? So we're very interested in this group of the somatomotor regions, uh, the community, using what people call modularity and analysis. It's like if you have it in a certain module, you would say that these areas are talking to each other more than to other areas of the brain. Got it. That would be considered a module. And so we're interested in this case in somatomotor regions because of some work done here by Christina Huckenschmidt, where if you take elderly people and characterize their sort of physical fitness, if you will, doing what's called a SPPB battery, which is a very simple test, actually. It has a few components, one of which is sit in a chair, Without using your hands, stand up and sit down five times, and you can time someone doing that. Yeah, that's not a trivial thing to do. And then another thing is a balance where you put one foot in front of the other and then keep doing that. And one's a walk. You can score people. Right. Older people who scored very well in this, brains had very intact somatomotor modules, cortex, if you will, and had very few connections from that cortex to the insula. As the scores got worse and worse, mm. the worst performing people had a lack of intactness, very inconsistent somatomotor cortex, and tons of connections between that and the insula. Mm. Young people in that same study had very intact somatomotor and very few connections. Hmm. So we were wondering pre-post in our study, what would this module look like? What would their connections to the insular cortex look like? And very long story short, the people who did use the beetroot shot changed over the time, and their brains at the end looked a lot like the younger people and with uh, very intact somatomotor cortex, very few connections to the insula. The insula known to process all sorts of things, interactions of cognitive and sensory and autonomic and all sorts of stuff, as opposed to the people who did not get the beat shot who had a lack of a cohesive somatomotor cortex module and lots of connections to the insula. Mm. And that's poetry at this point, but you hypothesize that perhaps they needed those connections with the insula. They're trying to monitor the world in a certain way in order to do their motor. That's the way they kind of get through the world, whereas these other people actually got better. Again, just the people who got the beetroot shot look more like the younger people. And I'm not going to sit here and say, you know, You'll be like a young brain if you do that. But there's no question that in these findings looked more like young people. And it also showed you can change in a very short amount of time. That's what's incredible to me. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. This short trial with... Pretty mundane intervention, by the pretty way. Pretty mundane. That just means that if you try a little bit, you're going to make some meaningful changes to the way your body is working. And this is another example of that, which is exciting. You're absolutely correct. And to take that another step further, especially as you age, you don't want to hear that you have to do high intensity training. Right. It's very do that. In fact, you could argue it's nearly impossible as you get in your 60s and 70s to do anything hard enough to get your heart rate up. And uh, so well, one of my colleagues, Jack Rajeski, will preach that, quite frankly, all you got to do is tell old people to get up and move. Yeah. Just get up. Just get up and move and be ambulatory and don't just sit there. And my garage door opener is broken right now and I haven't fixed it because mm. it forces me to get out of the car, mm -hmm. go over, make my garage open, get back into the car. Yeah, it's a pain, but but I'm not fixing it because it mm -hmm. forces me to do something else. And as you age, just keeping that in mind, you know, as silly as Fitbit is on some levels, it's actually quite good in that it's a reminder you need to keep moving. And I would even argue, I know Jack Rajeski would argue, that needs to be spread out throughout the day. So if you're sitting all day at a desk, if you're a young millennial who's working their tail off at Ernst & Young all day, just sitting there, sitting there, sitting there, and you go home and you pound your uh, pure bar or your high-intensity training swimming or something, yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. It's probably better that if you've been moving all day, use a standing desk. Make sure you just keep moving. And I think many researchers in this area would argue that is the case. It's doable. Yes. I mean, that's easy. You can tell someone to move. That's a lot easier than saying get a gym membership and join a class. I invented something called Intune Training, uh -huh. and it stands for Integrative and Opportunistic Training. In modern society, we think about physical activity as clustering all of our activity into a workout, and that's not bad, but that pattern is one of a sedentary lifestyle interrupted by bouts of mixed intensity working out. 
We give people daily totals for body weight oriented activity plus a daily step goal. And the idea is that as you finish an email, when you are getting ready in the morning and you take your shower, you understand what that workout is for the day and you just accumulate your reps. And so your day is now populated with activity across it versus having it all clustered into one period whenever that occurs. Not only is that reflective of more natural hunter-gatherer like movement pattern, it also reduces the barrier for how easy it is to say yes to some exercise right now. Now you're preaching to the choir. I, mean, I totally agree. And it can be intimidating. My parents are 82 and it's intimidating if you tell them you need to go to your workout facility and make sure you try to get your heart rate. I mean, that just move, go outside and walk, like you said. And with all the gadgets now, you can know if you've moved. I think that's powerful. So for your research, what's next for you? We always have lots of next steps of uh, all sorts of things that we're studying, right? But in the beetroot juice stuff, a much bigger, more robust look at its effects on the brain, which would be a much bigger trial and a longer trial. When that study does come out, I'd love to have you back on to talk about the results of that. Be my pleasure. Thanks for listening and come visit us soon at humanos.me.